I guess a lot of you want to learn everything about it. We'll <laughs> do our best, you know, um, uh, you know, because there's a lot going on. Feel free to raise your hand and ask questions as we go on. Um, but the, uh, just to let you know, some other things that are going on this weekend, we have Tech Day coming up where we're getting reps from um, different vendors coming here. Um, you could get up to 100% off on uh, some of your purchases, and that's happening uh, this Saturday. Okay, also to let you know, we are gonna be doing other um, colleges, you know, starting in the new year. I think we're taking December off, give us all a little bit of a break. Um, but we also do have hiking series, you know, where uh, other vendors, uh, Solomon Hiking Boots teams up with us, Northern New Jersey, Trail Conference, they team up with us and we do a lot of different hikes there. Um, I know um, Steve's have done a couple of the orienteering, so that seems very popular for stuff. Probably gonna be doing some, doing more of that. Yeah. some bow and drill, primitive fire starting in the spring. You know, a lot of cool stuff going on, okay? Um, so just to get us started, um, I'll let Steve. Uh, Hi, I'm Steve Caldwell, and uh, I'm gonna go through uh, some, uh, my a little um, display or a, a demo, not demonstration, a, a program on uh, winter camping. And well, as Russell said, this is a real stream of consciousness kind of thing. So to, like, if you have a question, just go ahead and ask a question because uh, I don't know what your questions are. <laughs> All right, so. Um, This is the Campmore uh, uh, College series for winter camping. And, um, oh, I misspelled it, sorry about that. <laughs> Campmore uh, or camping? <laughs> no, camping. <laughs> so, um, I thought this is really appropriate. Winter, uh, winter, the rugged season. So, winter, Winter definitely is the rugged season. It's got a little more things going on it than in spring, summer, and fall. And we're gonna go through a, a number of those little things. And, uh, but uh, the, um, this is a good example. This is actually taken from on top of Slide Mountain in the Catskills. And this would be a, a good example. It's a really beautiful place up at top Slide Mountain there. And, um, and uh, gee, it's a winter wonderland. Winter Wonderland, <coughs> or kind of some of the reasons we like to go winter camping is go to Winter Wonderland. I mean, it's one thing to just kind of see it at a postcard or, or maybe just go visit it and go home, but there's another thing that happens when you live in it, and then it becomes a different kind of thing. There's noises and sounds. There's a whole soundscape to winter that you don't have anywhere in any other season. Now, winter camping takes some extra attention. And the thing is, how do we avoid uh, be, uh, becoming like this guy camping? <coughs> so things to understand about winter first, because if you don't understand about winter first, you might end up like that guy. Like summer, winter is wet sometimes. Mostly when I think about camping, and, and you know, I, I see a lot of commercials on TV and stuff where the camping is, is showing and everything, and it's all these people having a great time. You look through magazines, look at everybody, it's all sunny and everything, you know. Not so much in my experience. Uh, my experience is uh, wet, wet, you know, I, I have a, a name for myself on, on a, one of several on my uh, Appalachian Trail walks, and, and it's not by any means, you know, very unique. Rain walker. I walk in the rain, that's <laughs> what I do, all right? And, uh, and that is, uh, the winter is just like the summer in that regard, no difference, except in the summer you get rain, fog, thunderstorms, sometimes pretty bad. Winter, <coughs> you get bonuses of freezing rain, sleet, wet snow, resulting in ice buildup, icy trails, and wet, penetrating cold. Yes! <laughs> the good news is that you don't have to become the shining ice man with a few precautions. All right, so uh, let's move on to somebody who knows who's, what, what they're doing a little more than Jack Nicholson. People have been winter camping for a long time. What does this guy understand about living in the winter? And believe me, he lived in the winter all the way through the winter. One, in cold weather, you will be a lot more comfortable with a hat on. You'd be surprised how many people don't go and go walking around out in the cold. Just, just, just walk around and see people walking around in the cold and they have no hat on, all right? Whatever you wear as an outer layer, 
needs to keep you dry, shed rain, freezing rain, sleet and snow, all the wonderful stuff that Jack didn't really take into consideration. For our vintage Yukon Jack Mountain Man, that was a bear skin. It is, a, it is waterproof and windproof. What can, we can't tell what Yukon Jack had under his bear skin, but keeping with the period, probably a wool shirt and a wool jack shirt or a sweater, uh, wool pants or overalls, wool long johns, not of the smart wool variety. These are old school long johns, wool, and they scratch, they were horrible, all right? On his feet, mucklucks, which back in the day is basically a uh, native um, insulated winter boot. And on his hands, mitts probably from the same material as his coat, waterproof, windproof. Inside his mitts, probably wool gloves, because if you don't, if you just have mitts and it's cold outside and you gotta fiddle around with your bindings or something, or you gotta tie knots, um, ouch, your hands are gonna go instantly, you know, nummy. Jump forward 200 or so years and the fabrics have changed, but the idea of layering is still the fundamentals of staying comfortable in the conditions winter will throw at you. And it will throw a lot of stuff at you if you want to meet winter. So you gotta be willing to do that if you wanna meet winter. Example how layering works through the day. You wake up in the morning, the sun rises on the cold night. You are snug as a bug in your, in your sleeping bag, getting out of the bag and into your all your camp clothes to go about the breakfast and waking chores. For wake up and breakfast, you are bundled up as you will pro, more, almost all bundled up as much as you'll be for the rest of the day. After packing up, packing up means getting out of your camp clothes and into your hiking clothes. And here is this is very important. Never hike ski or snowshoe in your camp clothes. Keep your powder dry. Because you're gonna need to get in that and you're really wanting to get in that warm, warm dry clothes at the end of the day. You always want to change into dry clothes at the end of the day. Those are your camp clothes. After changing into your hiking clothes, I often find it a good practice to dress a little lighter than perfectly warm would be. I want to say, gee, you know, I'm going outside. I gotta, you know, dress up. It's cold outside. Well, see, I underdress, all right, and I do that for a particular reason. Um, I will. I I do this because as I start to hike, I put out heat, and I need to be. Uh, and I when I put out the heat, I need to keep comfortable. I need to walk up to my my comfort. So you'll you'll get everything packed up. You'll you, um, you now you're you're a little chilly. You know you want to move. All right, that's what you're doing for the rest of the day. You're moving. So yeah, you want to dress to move, and uh, and the reason you want to do that is you want to keep the sweat down. You know this is not Bikram yoga. This is the opposite of that. You want to keep the sweat down, and. Russell has some... Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just talk a little bit more about the clothing now. Absolutely. Okay, so um, actually, so some of what Steve is saying is um, it's good to... We're talking about people trying to get into winter camping. Some of it's playing, going out in the backyard. When I go to shovel, I know when I first go outside, it's freezing, and I bundle up, and within five, ten minutes, I'm sweating. I also try to look at that as practice for winter camping, winter hiking. Okay, start out a little bit cool because within five minutes and wear layers so you can start to shed them. There's actually three different layers you actually want to wear all the time in that summer or winter. And the first layer is right up against your body. It's your wicking layer. Okay, so there's the wicking layer. Next layer, could be two, three, four layers, is your insulating layer. And then there's your protective <coughs> layer. So your insulating layer is worn right up against the body. Um, you want to stay away from cotton. Okay, mountaineers have an expression that cotton kills. And the reason that happens, and they say that is, cotton absorbs moisture like a sponge. And in the summer, a sponge, you're gonna feel all sticky. In the winter, you're gonna be very cold. So you, don't, you want a material that does not absorb um, moisture. So stay away from cotton. Wool will work okay, but there's so many different materials out there. Some are actually a little thicker, thinner, can add a little bit of an inseam layer but it needs to be worn a little tighter, what I call like a superhero. 
This way it can pull the moisture off of your, your body. Um, next you want your insulate, insulating layers. Again, fleece, wool sweaters. Um, some insulating layers can be two, three, four layers thick. Um, a lot of people have winter coats that have that insulating layer already built into it. Um, for hiking, I don't like that as much because you can't shed those layers. Okay, um, middle of the winter up in the Adirondacks, you know, you know, 10 below <laughs> zero or something, sometimes hiking with just a wicking layer and just a protective layer is all you really need while you're hiking. Once you stop though, you need to throw on a bunch of different layers. And again, that's something you gotta feel as you're hiking how to change things. Um, the next thing would be your protective layer. Um, in the summer, it might just be a shirt that keeps the sun off you. And in the winter, it's actually something that will keep rain off, um, you know, keep the wind off. And again, like I said, a lot of times I'm just hiking in this, just keeping the wind off of me. Some jackets will actually have what are called pit zips. They're zips in the armpits to help uh, get some of the moisture out. Using something like um, Gore-Tex will actually allow moisture to escape, okay? Um, if you have other questions on any of this stuff that we're talking about, people in our clothing department really know what they talk about. They could spend hours just talking about clothing with you. I don't want to bore you too much. Um, keeping that in mind, though, um, Just yes. a quick question. I mean, if, if you're camping and then hiking, you know, mm -hmm. obviously you're keeping the camping clothes separate from the hiking clothes. But if you're doing like a three-day hike. Okay, so if you are doing a three-day hike, well, one thing, um, so I have a pack, pack set up here. Um, this is actually more set up for fall, um, but what we were talking about, um, as far as um, I don't have any extra pants. I have a rain pants in here, and I have a um, rain jacket. If I'm hiking in the fall, most of the time I realize I'm just wearing my one pair of pants. Right. Why do I want to carry two, three pairs of pants? So um, but in the winter time, you need that. You need in the winter time, I would need extra layers. So what we have here is. Um, just besides wearing my long johns, I would have a fleece type of pair of pants. Um, they might be thicker, I might put two layers of those, but they're able to shed on and off easy. Um, my protective layer, this is actually a full zip, so I can take them on and off without having to take my boots off, depending on how hot or cold it gets. Um, so I will have extra clothing. Um, what we were talking about inside of here also though is um, what you have is what's called your sleep only clothes. Right. Okay, so I, I mean, I still even write this on my pack now. And in here, I do have an extra pair of socks. Right. I have an extra pair of long johns in here. I have a hat. This is my sleep only stuff and I protect that. At night, I need to be dry, comfortable, get a good night's sleep. Okay, um, I'll get with you. One second. Yes. Uh, yeah, so um, <coughs> if, you, all equipment works better when it's clean. Your right. sleeping bags, and when they're not dirty, they're gonna keep right. you warmer, so I can get inside of here. Like I was saying, sometimes I'm just wearing one or two pair of pants. If my pants are a little damp, unless it's a true emergency situation, I'm putting that damp clothes back on during the day. I can be miserable during the day, at night you can't be miserable. Right. You know, And That's probably hiking, generating enough heat that may right. also dry it That's off. That's what I was wondering. Hi. Yes. Okay, you pick up your backpack, and the question that came to mind was, how big should your hiking backpack for the winter be for change out? Okay, well, so this one here, again, so what we did pull out here, and um, this is actually a 60 liter, probably for, um, and this has enough stuff in here, freeze-dried food and stuff, for Friday night, three meals on Saturday, breakfast on Sunday. And also, so this here is a 75 liter. That's probably, you know, so a little bit bigger. Because everything's a little bit bigger. I only have a 20 degree bag in here. You know, putting a, a negative 20 degree bag or, um, you know, a couple extra jackets, you know, more insulin layer, everything does get a little bit bigger. Your tents are going to be probably for two people weigh about eight pounds instead of five pounds. So you're doubling probably some of that. So again, that pack definitely needs to be bigger. Okay. Um, but you don't want it too big where it gets sloppy. Okay. So a, six, a 60 is like the safe zone? The 60s probably, I think, a little too small for winter. I would probably go 70 or 75. 70, I think is probably good. So this is set up nice, for fall. Nice size. So go a little mm -hmm. bit bigger. Not but, too big. Um, so. I'll, I'll get back to a little bit of the clothing in a second, but what I do have here, and this I use all year long, is just a um, all-weather blanket. 
I like it especially in the fall, especially in the winter. What I'll do is um, I can throw that, out, spread that out, and I can throw my backpack, especially if there's a lot of leaves, wet leaves, snow, it keeps dry. My kids, they like making big fires, so they collect firewood and they worry about their firewood rather than their gear and they cover their firewood up at night. Yeah, so, uh, um, also too though, um, Steve set up over there in a tent. Sometimes packing in that tent is very, not a lot of room. So what I do is I throw all my stuff out of the tent onto this ground cloth and I pack outside where I have plenty of room to, to pack. Um, and then, uh, let's go to that in a second. Um, so again, back to just some of the other clothes, just so you know. Um, the same thing goes for your legs, your feet. Um, so you need a wicking layer. Um, there are sock liners, um, a thicker sock generally, and then a probably more of an insulated boot if you're doing some uh, um, winter camping. The boots can be a little bit looser, a little sloppier, so they trap in more air. Um, having said that, a lot of people, um, old school, you needed to wear a sock liner because the wool socks were so rough, they just hurt. Nowadays, there is a sock liner built into it, so this has your wicking layer, has your insulating layer, and then you have your protective layer all in one. If I'm doing a longer trip, like you said, three or four days, then what I'll do is I will bring the sock liners, because these can rinse out dry quickly, and that helps keep my socks cleaner. So again, for four days, I may be bringing two pairs of socks. Well, that's the next question. How are you drying anything out? Um, in the winter time. Well, stuff will dry even though it's uh, um, 20 degrees out. 20 degrees out. I mean, it, you know, it, it's although it's uh, freezing, it is very dry. It's not moist and humid, so stuff will dry a little bit more. Um, again, just keeping stuff hanging out. Sometimes uh, some people will just take and break and get the ice off of it. Sometimes just wearing them though will again create enough energy to heat up and uh, pull, pull the stuff off. Now, again, some stuff's gonna work different. I said two pairs of socks, maybe for four days. Some people might like bringing three, some might just do one. Everything we're telling you, again, when you practice and play around, um, you know, Steve might be telling you something a little different than I do, okay? Um, you have to, there's a lot of different Try ways to do things. Right. There's some wrong ways to do things too, but again, there's a lot of right ways, yes. Uh -huh. And again, the only other thing too, again, just, again, a little bit more with winter camping. Again, we're depending on how cold it actually is. You know, 32 degrees isn't really cold. Below zero starts to get colder. Um, but sometimes having a thin glove liner, that's your wicking layer. You can have a little bit more of an insulating layer after that, and then you have your protective layer. A lot of times, again, really cold temperatures, I'm building up so much stuff, a lot of times I just keep a thin glove liner on and use the shell just again to protect from the wind. And that's warm enough for most of the hiking. Once you stop though, warm yourself up, okay? As far as winter camping goes, if you start to get cold, warm yourself up right away. Just not say, okay, 15 more minutes, 15 more minutes, I'll start to warm up. It's easier to keep your body warm and steady than when it gets too cold and you try to warm back up, okay? Um, before we go back to the uh, presentation there, I'd just like to point out the other thing I bring camping, um, some people may disagree, the ever popular fanny pack. Okay, how many people own a fanny pack? Yeah, okay, good, okay, we're honest about it. Now what I do with this particular thing, why I like to bring it camping is, I will put this on in front, be proud. Um, put it all the way up, I, thank you. Um, I put my waist belt on and let this flop down in front of me. So. If I was only grabbing one thing, everything I need really is in here. Um, what I have, um, if my knife's not in my pocket, I have a small first aid kit, I have a, my map, um, I have a compass, a little survival kit, my matches, my headlamp. You know, everything that I really need for camping that I need to get at is right here. If I'm going to get some water, going to get some uh, uh, firewood, I grab this. When I set my tent up, first thing I do is I'll take this out and stick it inside the door so I know it's always in the right spot. Other stuff I may have to dig through to try to find, but again, this is the emergency stuff. Okay, people have any more questions on the clothing? If not, we'll be around a little bit later on too. We can answer questions that we missed. Okay, that was great, Russ, thank you. That's, that's way better than I would have. Um, so, 
Russell uh, talked about this a little, uh, it's a little earlier. Uh, if you start getting cold, uh, you, you should warm yourself up immediately. Well, this goes to stoking the furnace. You need to stoke, uh, stoke the stove to stay warm. Winter backpacking and camping will require 25 to 50% more caloric intake than the other seasons. The extra energy is your furnace that you need to stay warm. Hydration, this is really important. Proper hydration will increase thermogenesis, which essentially is a fancy term having to do with the uh, uh, calories, the calorie burning stage of metabolism. Increases, uh, in, increasing your metabolism is stoking your fire. So if you are taking in more calories, you gotta take in more hydration so that you are able to unleash all that extra calories to keep you warm. Really important. For this, for this reason, every meal needs to uh, needs a warm drink. Think stew, soup, and gruel. Oh yeah, gruel. Gruel's good stuff. You know, that's a any any cold cultures you'll see they have gruel as as basic meals that they eat. And there's a reason for that. A breakfast breakfast example from a friend of mine: oatmeal, a couple of pads of butter, chocolate, and raisins. Does that sound rich? <laughs> That's really rich, right? Well, there's a reason for that. If you're at 20 below zero and you're getting ready to go, you want to stoke that furnace, all right? And, and then you, off you go. Think comfort food that is quickly cooked. So uh, that's the, the idea. We want a lot of fats. We want a lot of carbohydrates. And, and we also want protein if we're on a longer trip. Yeah, when you're on a trip, you're not on a diet. No, you're so not. If you look you're at some using of the camping that. foods. Mm -hmm. Don't look at the ingredients. Mm -hmm. They have that extra fat in there, that extra salt, the extra stuff that you need when you're camping. Yep. Yep. With what? the hydration, I'm sorry. Yeah, just yeah. with the hydration, he was talking about drinking too. Um, this is the first time we're doing this together, so I don't know what he has on there. I looked at some of it. He doesn't know what I'm about to say, but um, <laughs> just a rule of thumb for drinking and staying hydration, staying hydrated. Um, there's three times you should drink. Okay. Drink when you're thirsty, drink when you're not thirsty, and drink in between. Okay, so stay <laughs> <Well hydrated>. said. <laughs> uh, Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The rhyme of the ancient mariner. Traveling through winter in most cases means we're traveling through a landscape of frozen water. Treating this water is just as important in the winter as it is in the summer. And what you, that thing is, there is, is a little giardia cyst with a, with, with a, with a coat on. And giardia is um, certainly able to survive frozen and very cold water, and that's why you gotta treat it, because otherwise, even though it looks like it's crystal clear flowing out of the mountain, it's probably not. Um, where do you get your water? Seems like a silly question if you're walking through a wa frozen water environment. However, water is in two states and three forms when you're in winter camping. Liquid flowing in streams and under ice in lakes and ponds. Be careful getting water from these sources. You don't want to get wet falling in. So um, you could, I, there was a time I was up in the cold river up in the Adirondacks on a, um, you know, like a five day trip and I needed to get some water. And um, for reasons that I'm going to go into shortly, uh, boiling snow is really not the best way to do it. So I saw a nice, I had the cold river there. So, but you go down this little bank and then there's out on ice and then there's water. All right. So you can just go walking out there, but that would be a fool's errand because there's, that's ice and you fall in, you get wet. My God, that is the last thing you want to do. I've seen my dog in the winter and she and he is constantly picking ways to go around getting wet because we have fur on our feet so we're running around trying to make sure that we don't get all kinds of caked up icy stuff on our paws and the reason we do that is the same reason you need to be careful around water and so I, I got a rope and there was an old bucket in a, in a, in a lean-to and I took that and I threw it into the into the river and I then pulled it out and I had enough water to, to just and now I have aqueous water which is really important for fuel conservation all right um, you also have 
uh, icicles. These are, if you have no rivers around you, these are uh, offer more bang for your BTU. All right, so BTU is British Thermal Units. The amount of heat you have to put into getting your water is a lot less with an icicle. So you'll have a rock outcrops and there's no streams around, nothing. You have, but you have icicles. You go up there and just bang off some icicles and throw them in your pot and start, you know, making water that way because it'll, it's already condensed. You've already had some time for the sun that it all, all the elements have, have melted it, it refroze. Now all you do is just put it in your pot and turn it into water. And then there's uh, uh, snow, which I identify as a fuel hog. It uh, just sucks all the fuel you have because it, it, it starts out this big and condenses down the water that big. And you pack it more and pack it more and pack it more. And you're using all your, all your fuel just trying to get water. Questions, uh, options for treating water. Boil, that's always your bottom line, boil. Use a lot of fuel unless you are doing this on a fire. Yeah, I had a, uh, I did a, a long trip in, uh, in January uh, and I, um, I ended up having a, a, teach, a teachable moment that I'm gonna talk about later, having to do with um, fuel and the type of stoves that work in cold weather and I ended up having to use fire every time I, every time I can. I, it didn't make any difference, right? it, 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 it snow, it ice, fire, Hits, it didn't make any difference. I had to build a fire every night to cook and make my food, period. And that's it. And uh, so, um, but I didn't have to use any fuel. I could find the fuel around. So if you have the ability to make fuel using firewood and you are on a longer trip, that extends your fuel quite a bit because you're using fuel that's around you. Um, filter. I've had so many people call me and says, I used my filter up in the Adirondacks in February and now it's broken. Yeah, that's right, it broke. The reason it broke is the first time you used it was fine. The second time you used it, the plunger wouldn't work, or the uh, uh, lever wouldn't work because the whole thing's frozen solid as a block of ice. Yeah, you could say, gee, I could keep it close to me, not me, I don't want a lot of water that's cold next to me in my sleeping bag. No way, I'm not sharing my bag with anything like that. That's right. stuff you have to keep in consideration too. Mm -hmm. You see on this pack here, um, you know, have the uh, hydration systems. This hose will freeze, and that's so what he's talking guys, about. Can't break any water out Same of it. thing. These yep. hoses and filters will freeze right mm -hmm. away. Right okay. away. There are some that will have some tubes on it, like uh, insulating tubes. But again, yeah, yeah they'll they'll, they'll help extend your time <clears throat> a little bit. But again, if you're out for a couple days. There's not much is going to happen, too. Um, if your water bottle, if it's just like in the 30s or something like that, if you can store your water bottle, if it's a good water bottle, um, <laughs> if you store it upside down, um, ice actually starts freezing from the top That's down. That's a good idea. So then um, you can flip it up and you still have some water on top. That's a great idea. That's awesome. Thank you. I didn't thought of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Uh, and uh, the final and uh, 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 go-to for really cold uh, treatment of water is chemical treatment, chemical, chemically treating the water. Uh, this is the most fuel efficient method. You warm the water, then you put your, your aqua tabs in, and you'll unsit for the requisite amount of time as the instructions say, and then you've got your water all set up and ready to drink, and you're not gonna have somebody with a jacket and uh, an assist to come and mess with you later down. Now a lot of these chemicals that they are putting into the water nowadays, people, ooh, chemicals. A lot of this is what a lot of, um, uh, what was I say, states are actually using to filter their own water or purify mm -hmm. their own water. So it's yeah. what other states are already using in their water. It's not like these funky chemicals that you're only getting here. They're tested and yeah. yeah. Exactly. If the water around you looks like this, that's the icy waterfall there, a really nice spot that you could you know, come across as you're hiking and, and you come across that. Um, and you leave your treated water out at night, it will look like this in the morning. Like yourself, you need to keep your water warm, both while camping and while underway on a hike, ski or snowshoe for the day. And what I, I often start off my day because I boil up some water, and then I'll put it in my bottle, 
and then I have a, uh, I have hot boiling 212 degrees Fahrenheit water in my water bottle and that pretty much goes through the whole day and by the end of the day I have nice cold ice cold water that I'm finishing off and then I just recreate my new water uh, which is I'm going to eat um, you know it's going to be part of my fixing my meal my drinks um, and the rest of the water I'm going to need for the night now the good doctor has something to say about your stove in the winter. I should have took it as advice because I had to learn this the hard way. Your trusty jet boil, pocket rocket, Optimus, Crux, and any pressurized gas canister stove that you have, isopro of some sort, uh, you, and you just love them because they're so simple to use. You just take them, you screw them on, and you put a match to them, you're, 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 making, your, you're making your meal. No time flat. All right? When that, when it gets below freezing, your stove will start singing, uh, it's cold outside. It will soon sputter and no longer work. This is due to a chemical and physical principles that is the wall of science. When the temperature below is, falls below 32 degrees, and you have a kind of a, a grace area there between 32 and 20, all right, you can get away with it with isopro. Um, but after that, it starts to dwindle. And what's happening is that the, 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 the mixture, which is isopro, is a combination of butane and propane. Propane has a very, you can use it in really, really cold weather. That's why you, you see propane tanks out in rural areas where people are using it for cooking gas. All right, but butane has, you know, it's pretty much around, uh, um, you know, it's about 30, 35, 30 to 20 degrees, and then it doesn't work anymore. What happens is that the atomized pressurized gas in the canister liquefies and goes down and then you have a negative pressure in the tank and it no longer is pushing gas out into your stove and your stove goes it's like it's terrible and if you have like five days and you have to like cook on something that doesn't work anymore you say why do I have this with me all right um, for this reason uh, you will want to a winter liquid fuel stove like oh whoops I'm very upset very like a whisper light stove uh, by no means the only stove that's uh, like this but um, um, you have uh, uh, unleaded gasoline or, or Pullman fuel in there and you have a pump these come with pumps and you pump them up and you pressurize them no matter what the temperature is outside. So you're carrying your fuel in a uh, container like this mm -hmm. instead of a regular propane type of canister. Yeah, so it's a liquid fuel. It's heavier, yes, but it burns at you know 10 below zero. And believe me, at 10 below zero, you're gonna want your stove to work. It's really important, all right? Um, so. Winter, sh winter shelters. You don't have to worry about mosquitoes. I was on a trail in, in January, and somebody asked me, "Why am I walking all the way to, uh, you know, a, a 140 mile hike in the middle of the winter time? Yeah. There's no snakes, there's no bears, and there's mosquitoes. Are you kidding me? This is perfect. I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. All I have to do is stay warm, all right? So, um, let's talk about the tents. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, just some of the main differences in your shelter. So. Uh, uh, Steve actually has this set up here. We can go look at it later on, but it's just a, that's keeping the snow and the wind off of him. He also has a bivy shelter underneath it. Okay, so that bivy shelter is like a. It's not keep, really set up right yet. It's not. Oh, we'll, we'll set we'll that up later. That minute, but it yeah. actually it goes over your sleeping bag, and there's really like a cocoon that keeps you toasty inside, breathes a little bit, keeps you dry. Um, that's more for the hardcore, <laughs> okay? Uh, I like a tent or something. But the main differences between a four season tent and a three season tent is four season tents are generally one season winter, okay? Um, in a regular two season tent, really part of it is, is you don't have as much, uh, you don't have as much breathable material or netting, okay? Um, also too, part of it's the ability to hold a snow load. So if I push on this particular tent here, the poles aren't breaking, but it's not really holding anything. So instead of just having your two poles that crisscross, a geodesic design will actually have extra poles that come to the front and back. So when you lean on it, they're really not buckling. They're all holding up each other. 
um, there's a lot more guide points for snow load and wind. Now what you don't realize, if you see how I'm pulling on here, it still may change the shape a little bit. Winter tents actually like this particular one has some guidelines inside where if you ever seen it, uh, mountaineers in some movies and stuff, there's like spider web lines. There's different lines inside of here that are also help pulling that you can set up in really, really harsh conditions. Okay, your fly does come down a little bit lower. The vestibules usually have flaps to help hold in some of that warmth, but you're only getting a couple degrees warmer. You will notice some warmth, especially when some bodies are in there, but that's not really where you're getting your warmth at night. It's really your clothing, good sleeping bags, sleeping pads where you're actually getting your, uh, um, you know, your warmth from. But again, the, instead of having mesh netting, you'll have breathable material. Um, you do want a little bit of this vent open and that will help reduce the condensation. Although it might be a little bit cooler, you're not going to get wet, okay? The tent should not leak, but again, if there's a lot of condensation inside of there, rubbing against the walls, just like your car where you have to turn the defrost on, you may get your arm wet. Hopefully your car is not leaking. Same thing with the tents, okay? Um, although some people will actually cook inside of their tents, you know, it's not really recommended. Um, but in any situation, you have to weigh the, uh, um, I, I guess, the uh, hazards that could happen and not, and again, in the, you know, what type of situation you are in. If you're just in the backyard, yeah, you're not going to want to do that. If you are really stuck out there in a storm, you may have to do some stuff you may not normally do. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions on the tents at all? I had a quick question back about the stove where you said the fuel doesn't work like what temperature does that start usually to usually uh, around uh, 20 degrees okay. after that and, and, and you can probably get away with an overnight you know where you know it's gonna work you know because it's still kind of acclimating to the temperature outside but if you're gonna go out for three or four days then it starts to go doesn't work and all of a sudden you know, the stove doesn't work depending on how much you want to so some people that only have a propane stove and are doing some cold weather they're sleeping with their propane tank I, that was my next in their question. sleeping bag. You could do that. Anything yeah. to help keep it warm. Yeah. You know, but again, that's something you'd have to do. Three, four, or five days in, it just may not get warm. Yeah, it anymore. doesn't. I actually get so, it. Doesn't work. So oh. true situations. There are <laughs> so, yeah. certain like uh, you know, there's certain things you need for certain applications. You know, just a day or two, or just to try it out. You yeah. Can, yeah. Then possibly then maybe get okay. away. Yeah. Way with it. Talk about well, I'm going to talk about, um, yes, so we, we have our shelter Russell, you know, laid out how the, this tent and uh, there's also lean tubes. Now in our area, we have a lot of lean tubes. Harriman has lean tubes, the Catskills, the North, this particular lean tube is on the North Bill Lake Classic Trail, which is a 130 mile trail in New York State that uh, goes through the Adirondacks. And uh, lean tos uh, have a real advantage. You, you, you can stand up in them. That's awesome. You can't really stand up in this tent. If I'm standing up in this tent, I, I've got a problem. So I'm not going to be able to do that. And changing clothes, being able to stand up is really nice. Um, it's a little easier than sitting. And if you, you know, you could try getting into your clothes, uh, you know, at home by sitting on the floor. <laughs> sit on the floor and get in your clothes, all right? Normally we sit on a chair or we, you know, standing up and putting our pants on and stuff like, no, 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 you gotta sit on the floor and see how to do that. <laughs> that would be essentially what, you know, in a tent you would be doing. But in a lean-to, you have the luxury of not having to do that. Uh, the one downside of lean-to is they're drafty. <laughs> it's just open end, they're a run-in shed that, you know, they were designed on a run-in shed for the horses to use. And um, so that's why I had bringing a tarp this is why I, I travel with this tarp, because I can stay in a lean-to and I can also build a shelter as I have right here, by using my trekking poles. And um, so if it's a, and the other thing about shelters is they, 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 they usually set them up so they face the sun, which is fine, except for if you, there's a, there's a shelter on top of Balsam Lake Mountain that faces southwest and it's great, the sun sets, it's warm, it's nice. And then when the weather comes in and it's freezing rain and sleet, it drives it right into the, right into the lean-to. Blah, you know, and so you're huddled over in a corner, you know, and it, so, you know, you can use tarps 
inside of a, sh of a shelter like that and build a smaller little shelter that you can stay out of the weather in. So that, that's a, a couple reasons why I like actually packing with a tarp all the time. Uh, wow, I'm tired, it's time for bed. Once you have changed into your dry camp clothes, you will want to make sure your day clothes do not end up frozen. That happened to me, <laughs> right? I had to walk around in frozen clothes. I was a lesson that I, uh, I took to heart. So what I do is on my, winter camp, on my winter pack, I carry two pads. I carry a Thermarest pad, which is about three and a half, three point five 3.5 um, R value, which is the insulative capacity of, of, um, of a pad to keep your warmth in the ground. And then I use uh, a uh, Z-Lite pad. Z-Lite pad can be packed outside of my pack, uh, like Russell did with his, uh, his space blanket, uh, because it doesn't absorb any moisture. My Thermarest pad, on the other hand, I have to make sure it doesn't get wet because it has open cell foam on the inside, just like the foam you'd find uh, in your sink uh, when you do dishes. So between the two of these, it's, it's a fully insulated, I can sleep on ice and snow and not feel it underneath me. And that's important because you're not only, only going to stay as warm as your body can counteract the effects of the cold earth underneath you. Guess who wins if you don't have enough? The earth. You are just gonna freeze. Every bird builds a nest and every animal has a lair. They always are filling it up with stuff that insulates them. And that's what we have to do when we go, when we create our sleep space. But what I do is, see, if these are my camp clothes, what I do is, since they're damp, and God only knows what happens to them during the day, falling in snow pits and stuff like that. Uh, I will put them, I don't want them to get frozen. I don't wanna be like that lady there with frozen underwear. So I'll put them and lay them down here and I'll do a sandwich so that I can keep my clothes from freezing. Uh, and then I put my pad over the top. Now, since I'm bivouacking, um, I have my sleeping bag and I'll put that on top. And then I use my bivouac sack and I put this, even though I have a tarp over me, if you have blowing wind and snow, it's gonna blow in on you, all right? It can blow in on you in a lean-to as well. It won't blow in on you on a tent. That's an advantage of a tent, that you can, you can totally, you're totally seal yourself off in that kind of stuff. But you do have to carry this, and that's rather heavy. Um, so, This, these also come in very handy in lean-tos. I've been in lean-tos where um, it's the it, uh, storm came up at night and uh, it, um, it got so bad that uh, by the time I woke up in the morning, I had about three to four inches of snow on top of me uh, because <laughs> they built the, the lean-to facing the direction of the weather. <laughs> and uh, that became a... Uh, then they're happy to have your bivy sack. Can you uh, also develop condensation? You can, and that's why you never close a bivy sack off. All right, you keep it open. Some people think, oh man, I could go super lightweight. I could just get a bivy sack and sleep in it. And what happens when you do that is exactly what you saw talking about. You end up swimming in your own condensation. And that is horrible. Yeah, it's really, I've done that too. I've done every possible thing that you could possibly think of that's stupid. <laughs> and so, um, you know, you, you learn these lessons as you, uh, you know, like Russell said, you play around with it. And um, so my face would be in here, but I wouldn't zip this all off. I would just keep it open. And then I'd, you know, be all cinched down and uh, my face would be like a little nose sticking out of there. And that'd be it. And uh, then all this would go inside. But one last thing. I boil, I boil water. And fill this all up with boiling water. And I throw it in the bottom of my sleeping bag. 
and then I climb in my sleeping bag and I have this hot water bottle feeding up the bottom of my sleeping bag, getting it nice and warm and toasty. And then in the evening, you know, as you sleep during the night, you get thirsty, especially when you're camping outside. And so I just lay, bring my legs up like that and the water bottle slides right down to my chest. I open it up, take a drink, do like that, and throw it right back down the bottom of the bag. I'm having really, you know, it's insulated, so it stays warm all night long. And so if I, I drink about, you know, this much of it, I got my coffee ready in the morning. I just, boom, fire, fire up the stove. I got my coffee. And uh, the other water I buried in my pack so that, and I, I basically use my pack uh, as an insulator of, of my water. Sometimes, though, it's so cold that you can't really do that. So, you know, storing your water is just going to be a fool's errand. It's just going to freeze because if, if you've ever been 15, 20 below zero outside, it's just not going to work. So at that point, you just have to get up, go get your water, make your water, and then everything for the rest of the day. Those are your chores for waking up. Yes? I, I hate to ruin the party. Now, everybody's concerned about BPAs and chemicals leaching out, and you're throwing boiled water in the plastics. BPA free. Okay. Okay. Yeah, most most of your nice water bottles, <laughs> most of your water bottles nowadays are BPA free unless yeah. they're like made in China. All right. Or something. Yeah, so, yeah. so, is there like any kind of uh, anecdotal stuff to say that you shouldn't put hot water in any plastic bottle? Nope. Yes, there is. Okay. I'll show you the hot. I'll show you the plastic bottle you don't want to do that with. Well, while he's while he's getting that bottle, so other things you do have to be careful of, though. Okay, so if it's very cold, what has happened if you put water on there, some water gets on the threads or something like that. The threads, they can freeze a little bit and you think you have a good seal, mm -hmm. okay? So make sure you're using a good water bottle. The Nalgene's are very good and they seal tight. But you're, it could be frozen a little bit. It looks like you get a good seal. It's in your sleeping bag, warms up a little bit and it starts to shake. So that's the other thing you have to be careful of. Um, yes? Pre-waxing the threads? Um, I don't know if that's gonna prevent, it might keep water off oh. the threads, but not, again, you shouldn't have to do all that. Just make sure that it's yeah. Again, dry, but because wax could still get on, I mean, water could still get on below the threads inside your bottle cap. Um, also, though, too, like we were talking about hiking and start out a little bit cold. Okay, what I found is in my sleeping bag, I like to start out a little bit cool. Okay, and the reason being is um, I'm putting all this insulation, it's like putting another coat on top of me. So when I first get in there, my body is going to start to warm up a little bit. Or if I find that I'm starting to get a little hot, I'll take my socks off. Because you will start to perspire if you're too hot. And what happens to a lot of people is they get in that sleeping bag, they're done trying to change, they're creating energy, they warm up, oh, this is toast, this is nice. But then they start to sweat, perspire a little bit. And then three, four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> when it really starts to cool down, mm -hmm. they're damp. So again, just like hiking, try to take off some of those layers, throw them back on. Um, and just to add to what um, uh, Steve was talking about with your sleeping pads, the different R values and stuff like that, the reason you need to insulate from the cold is your sleeping bag is insulated on top and it's insulated on bottom. But once you lie down on it, that insulation isn't as thick anymore, so it's not trapping as much air. So that's why you need some more padding on there. Other things you can do if I've gotten cool at night is put my backpack over my feet, take my rain jacket, put that over, you know, bundle up. Um, if you're just starting to get go out camping, um, you can get a sleeping bag liner that will add five to ten degrees to your normal bag. So you don't necessarily have to go out and get a negative 20 degree bag right off the bat. Um, also, too, the difference is if you don't know the difference between a rectangle and a mummy shaped bag. That rectangle bag, if you see all that extra material, um, it's extra weight. That's also extra areas that you have to cool, um, warm up with your body. Um, if you do have clothes that are dry and clean enough, you can actually put the next day clothes in your sleeping bag to keep them warm. Um, we were talking about moisture in the bag. Um, you don't ever want to breathe into your sleeping bag. That moisture that you're expelling is actually like taking a cup and a half's worth of water and dumping that into your bag. Okay, so again, maybe putting a balaclava, uh, um, uh, trying to think of a buff, you know, or just something and breathe through that, that will help keep your body a little bit warmer. 
again, unless it's a real emergency situation, don't breathe into that bag. Okay. This is the bottle you don't want to add boiling water to, because it tastes nasty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and you had some questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, do you need the baby sack if you have a regular tent? No. Okay. Uh, tent, you don't, you you can do without the baby sack. He's just sh for. he's showing off. Yeah, except for <laughs> yeah. Um, if you have a really, there are some really good winter tents that have a lot of, they're really narrow and they're small and you rub up against them, all right? And then uh, you don't really need a baby sack, but you know you can just zip up your shell and put it under the bottom. If you notice you just keep on bumping against the, the tent and it gets condensation and it's starting to get wet and you get concerned about that. You just take your, your uh, rain shell and zip it up around the bottom of your uh, sleeping bag, and then you kind of accomplish the same thing with a whole lot, you know, double, double, doing double purpose with, with something you're carrying. Just in case it comes up, I'm going to now contradict everything we just said. <laughs> moisture, 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 okay? Um, another way to keep your sleeping bag, um, especially if you have a down bag to keep that dry, is um, or keep yourself warmer and add some degrees to your sleeping bag is what's called a vapor barrier liner. This is basically a garbage bag. Okay? Nylon garbage bag. Nylon garbage <laughs> bag. And what you do is you put this inside of the sleeping bag. This does not breathe. If you don't have breathable stuff, you build up moisture. But it's also holding in the heat. So if you had really good wicking layers, you climb inside of your bag and it's going to be moist. It's not going to. You're not going to be soaked, but you're not. You're you're, you're not mm -hmm. going to be dry. But it will keep you warm. So a lot of people will use vapor barrier liners, knowing they're wearing their wicking material. They'll be warm, but again, it's going to feel like you're sweating all night long. That sounds very really okay? uncomfortable. It could. It can <laughs> be. Awful. It can be very uncomfortable too. <laughs> but again, especially though too, depending on what you're doing. If you had a down bag, you don't want that moisture to go in. Um, one way I found out how much moisture is actually in a sleeping bag, just your body, just overnight, I was rubbing against the tent, we had three people in the tent, and my sleeping bag was getting a little bit wet, so like, I'll show them, and I put a garbage bag over my feet and went up to about my knees, you know, woke up in the morning, and my bag, right where the plastic bag was, was wet from there down. Oh, wow. you know, so you are giving off moisture. So again, everything we talked about so far is moisture management hiking, sleeping, cooking. So you're saying that liner goes inside the sleeping bag? It goes inside the sleeping bag. But you have to wear like moisture wicking clothes. Well, like you should be wearing wool. that regardless, but yeah. yes, but you definitely have to make sure you're moisture wicking. And you are going to wake up damp. You're going to wake up damp. Mm -hmm. So Warm, there's context uh, to this waking particular up's the good thing. tool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what a vapor barrier was designed to do was to keep, like Russell said, down bags from getting moisture. Also, even synthetic bags get in. But they, they, just so that we have this properly wrapped around in our head, that was for really long trips, like like dog sled trips for longer periods of time or, or a, a longer uh, uh, trip in the winter where you're going to be out for quite a while. Uh, because and you have no ability to dry your bag, so you had to be, you had to keep all that moisture next to you and out of your bag because the, you know it starts to freeze. If you're if you're walking at at like 15 below zero or, or 10 below zero, and your sleeping bag's back here in your pack, and you packed it all up, and you're gonna walk for eight hours, all right? You, you know that stuff. You know that even though there's moisture in there, um, it's gonna start to freeze. So the, one of the things when I pack up my sleeping bag in the winter is I. I, uh, first off, when I'm making food, I unzip it and flail it open. So whatever moisture's in there, it goes, it, 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 it first goes out because it's all excited, it's warm, it's going up, it's leaving. But then it, you know, it'll just freeze and dissipate. Um, and then, I'll, before I pack it into my, my, uh, my stuff sack, I'll take it, lay it out flat, roll it all the way up so I can squeeze all the air out of where the head is. And then I'll pack it in, so that I've really kind of done the best I can with any moisture that might be in there, and I extended my range. So it's just you know it's a little bit of I think boils down to being a little fastidious. That's what that uh, winter camping is about being fastidious. It's attending to details. And uh, you can't say that you can't go winter camping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I guess I get to stay home. Yes. <laughs> Um, there's many different materials, so um, to, to roll it really flat is it 
Well, I mean, they, there's different compression sacks, and they're called stuff sacks because you stuff them in, you don't roll them in. Yeah. He was rolling the air out, then he's stuffing it back yeah. in. Um, mostly there's like down, which are like your feathers. The other stuff, there's many different brands of materials. I'm just gonna say they're like pillow material, where you know you open the pillow up and it's all this yeah. stuff in there for all practical purposes. I mean, our sleeping bag people can really tell you what they're made up of. Again, uh, uh, but right. opening them up, I, I'll open mine up even in the summer right away just to get it to fluff up. Besides letting that moisture up, um, they don't like to be cramped up. You know, the fluffier it is, the warmer it's going to be, the cleaner it's going to be. Having said that, um, you know, how many people have stuff sacks with for their sleeping bags? You know, are they in the stuff sack at home now? No. Nope. Okay, I just good. took mine out. Right. They, they, <laughs> shouldn't be, they shouldn't be kept in. They should be hung on a hanger, loosely in a pillowcase or something. Again, that keeps them so they keep springing back to life. So, again, that's the best way to store them that way. Um, you have any other questions on the sleeping bags, sleeping pads? Okay. So, again, Steve will carry two. There's different, there's different thicknesses. Um, some people will carry, like, this one here, this R value on this particular one, and just how warm stuff is, this is 6.8. It's a lot thicker, but it's also bulky and heavier. Some people may want to carry something a little bit smaller. Um, generally, you want to stay away from air mattresses. Okay? What people are, when I'm saying air mattresses, is there's just cold air running underneath. Having said that, though, one of the pads Steve has here, or this one here, still has a 2.5 or 3 R value because this is a new air mattress. Um, uh, it has actually some space blanket material in there or some have down feathers in there. So that will bring that R value up and make it into something that's decent. Yes? What is R value and then how much R value do you actually want? R value is um, gonna be your uh, it, like insulation in the house. How okay. thick that insulation is, how warm this bag is, how much is actually holding in. I don't know the scientific term for R value. Radiant retention, I think it is. Steve might know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, is there like a magic number you want to hit, and do you like add all these things there's up? There's not really a magic number. I mean, I just know from some of the camping trips I've had, a lot of people used to, in the summer, carry like a three-quarter pad, and then a long pad for fall, and then double these up. This is about a 2.4, so I'm guessing around a five. You know, but again, uh, I, I've always carried what I had, <laughs> you know. If I'm on a shorter trip, I like ha having a little bit more comfort. If there's snow on the ground, when you look for your area and you can pad your snow down, you can pretty much make yourself a level area and be softer. Having said that, there's not a lot of snow on the ground. For adults, if you splurge in any particular area, it's a very good sleeping pad. Adults need to recuperate at night. You know, <laughs> most scouts that I deal with, I say this is good through their eagle, which is 18 years old. This is all they need to sleep on. Um, two, this is two and a half inches. Or three, how thick is this one? Uh, it's a thermarest. Uh, one inch. Uh, so they're between one to you know, one, one, and a half. one and a half, three inches. So thicker pads can actually you know, be more comfortable, and it usually adds to that. So I, I, there's a common thing that happens when I talk to people uh, and they say the sleeping bags aren't warm and stuff. And then I, I, I've seen camping with people. They're, they're, when you first take your sleeping bag out of your stuff sack, it's going to be all crunched up, you know, and it's just going to be like, it's like a wet noodle. All right? You need to loft it. So what I do is I, I'll go like this. You gotta, yeah, I spend a little time doing this kind of stuff, you know, and get the get the down, in this case it's a down bag, but even in a, in a bag like that, you, you want to do that because everything has memory of being crushed up, and then when you unleash it, it goes like this. You want it to be like this, all right? So you gotta, you got to encourage it to let loose, and, and uh, that, that's a really important thing to get the best out of your sleeping bag. Yeah, so as far as sleeping bags go, as far as being comfortable in a bag, I was talking to some people earlier. A lot of times with anything you do, if you want to start to get out into the uh, cold weather camping, is you know I know a lot of people testing new tents out, they just go out, out in their backyard. It's a great way, you can always come back inside, you forget something. Um, you can start out with two sleeping bags if you wanted to, or just to 
extra sleeping bag all over everyone. But also sleeping too. Now some reason sleeping bags can be uncomfortable um, is if you, you know, have the wrong sleeping bag, the wrong temperature. If it's hot, you want to start to spread your arms out. If you ever watch a baby sleep, they're like, ah, when they're hot. When they're cold, they roll up in a ball. So if you're in a very cold situation, your sleeping bag's not warm enough, you're trying to crunch up and the bags aren't designed to, to roll. Vice versa, if you're too hot, you're trying to spread out and those sleeping bags aren't letting you do that. So you may need to add that sleeping bag liner, wear extra clothing, adapt uh, to the thing. Yes? What about the quilt system? Putting a quilt inside? Yeah, or, or just or using the quilt? On top? Yes. Um, now I see the market is coming out with a... Like a backcountry quilt. Yeah, well back there's what's called a backcountry quilt. My son uses a, with the backcountry quilt that he's using, um, actually doesn't have any zippers. Yes. It has an opening and a sleeping, like it's like a blanket that comes over or you can tuck it under. Those right now are not really warm enough for cold weather camping. They only go down to like maybe like a 20 degree bag or something like that. They're excellent. I love them. I can roll, I like rolling around. And I like bag, the concept of that. That bag stays underneath you. So they're, they're great bags. They're just not warm enough right now. Um, you know, again, um, till it gets really cold or I need to worry about my the weight and pack size, I'm still using a rectangle bag. And I might bring a second bag sometimes, again, depending on how far I'm going and using it like a blanket. I just like that. It's more comfortable for me. But I do know, um, same thing, if I'm carrying it, I'm getting a lighter bag. I'm getting that cold weather. I'm getting that more compact bag. Same thing with my sons. They're like, you know, 14, 16. You know, they've been camping for a while. Um, if they're going on a shorter trip, they're grabbing that big, big sleeping pad and they're sleeping comfortable. Otherwise, they know they're smart enough, this is enough for them. You know, so again, a lot of it is really just changing and adapting, finding out what works for you best. But again, like I was talking about practice sleeping, sometimes the sleeping bags are uncomfortable because it's not your own bed, it's not your own pillow, you're not used to it. That second night, third night, I'm really getting a good night's sleep. But that first night, there's just so much going on. There's these weird noises, animals making noise, you know, wind blowing, leaves rustling, you know, who wants to hear that? You know, no cars, no horns or anything. And then you're stuck in this like sleeping bag. So if you can get used to one of those before you get on that trip, like sleeping without the pillow or a rolled up uh, uh, jacket for a pillow in a tight, there it is, you know. Again, the more you can get used to stuff, the more things work. And winter camping, I keep saying work, it's work. <laughs> like I said, everything we talked about, unpacking is work, setting a tent up in the snow is work, um, cooking is work, making water is work, everything. But when you get home, it's like, yeah, I did it. And it's, it's, it's great that that memory lasts so much longer. You forget about all the work. You just know how, how much fun you had. And, you know, you also see things in winter and, this, and spring and fall and summer are very <laughs> different times. Um, the soundscape, I think, for winter to me is, is, is uh, really phenomenal. Um, you, 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 there are animals around. You can see animal trails. You can see that they run in tunnels and tunnel around and come over and tunnel around. You can see that. You can see other, you know, you're, you're, tracking is a lot easier. You can see all the activity that's going on that in the summertime, it's hard to see because it's, you know, it's covered with all kinds of leaves and ferns and stuff like that. Um, you can, uh, you know, to get up on top of mountains, you get uh, views that are outstanding because the air, when it's cold, is much clearer than when you have, uh, you know, it uh, has, when it's warmer outside, a lot more moisture in the air. Um, <clears throat> there's just this one thing I just love to do when I'm way out in the, in, in the snow, way up in the Adirondacks in the high country. And that sometimes you just been working and climbing and you've been snowshoeing and you're just really tired and you're just leaning on your poles like this. And I open my mouth and it's so quiet, I can hear the blood going through my veins and my throat. That's quiet. <laughs> you know, that's really quiet. You know, you can, and then you're, you're like, wow, you, you get another, you know, it's kind of like you, the poem, you were the thing you had shared, you know, yes. about, about you know, remaking yourself, you know, well, there you, this is the essential reality of me, you know, my heart pumping, 
And, uh, you know, that's, wow, you know, I can't hear that any other time. Literally, I can't. And so, there you go. It's a different it's a, reality. It's a different reality, yes. You, you are slightly, you are on a different planet. You know, you, you're, you're on the same planet, but it's not the planet you mostly live in. It's a different planet. And you're exploring. And we all are here because we love to explore. And I hope... So. I don't know if you have any more slides. No, kind of no more slides, so we'll just talk. So, um, <laughs> there's, uh, just he was talking about snowshoeing and stuff. Other yeah, stuff you do yeah. have to be prepared about. Um, and we may do another talk later on, uh, college talking just about snowshoes. But really, uh, snowshoes might be a way to get around. You know, if you wake up and there's two feet of snow in the ground and you're having to trudge <laughs> through all this stuff, um, having a pair of snowshoes is very good to have. Also, too, you might get to towards the top of the mountain and it's just windblown and there's no snow, but it can be ice on there. So um, it's also good for, again, not just for camping, um, but um, having a pair of uh, ice crampons mm -hmm. that just attach to your hiking boot. Um, you know, so when you do get to the top of the mountain, you we switching from end to end. Um, there's your regular snowshoes too, because now you really have to, snowshoes generally are going by weight. And now you're adding another 35, maybe 40 pound pack, um, depending on the weight, you may have to get a bigger snowshoe. Um, the reason I grabbed these though, these are very popular in this area or up in the Adirondacks. They're more of a simple sort of one size fits everybody. You could add tails to give you a bit more of a loft, but why they're very popular around here or up in the Adirondacks. Although you like that solitude of going out there in the snow, Somebody already went before you. They got up a half hour early. They didn't stop at McDonald's for breakfast. They already made that trail, so you don't have to worry about as being as fluffy. Also, um, on the East Coast, the snow is also a lot damper, thicker. So even if it was fluffy one day, two days later, it's going to be padded down. So you don't have to have as much loft. Or in the case of the Adirondacks, it is overused a lot where people have matted it down. Although you get another foot of fresh powder, it's matted down underneath that. More powder, again, matted down. So mm -hmm. these will actually fit flatter up against the backpack um, a lot more comfortable than, than say, uh, something like these with a different binding or something like that. And they do have that ice crampons. Um, crampons. Other things we didn't talk about so much would be, again, to have that balaclava or face mask to breathe through. It can get very windy. There are times where you need to cover every bit of your skin. So um, also you do need to worry about like snow blindness being very, very bright. So getting a nice pair of glasses. Um, there are glacier glasses that actually have block the sides or goggles. If you are wearing goggles or sunglasses, the best thing to keep them from fogging up, if they fog a little bit, deal with it. Now what I mean by that, the more you start fussing, cleaning back on, off, on, off, the foggier and the worse they're going to get. So if you can just deal with a little bit, you deal with it. Is there other questions or anything you guys want? Yes. I have. I got all the questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so that on the floor, that's one of those like emergency blankets. Oh, right? Yes. Yes and no. I'll call that. I'm going to call it more of a uh, what would that be called? It, uh, this uh, all weather blanket. I have one of the. I think it cost me like five bucks, okay. or like under ten bucks. Like so an emergency the space like blankets, player. and I do have like in my ever popular talking about the fanny pack. I do have a survival kit that has a space blanket. A space blanket, I'm going to call a little bit different. The space blanket is this size here. What Mike has is a little bit thicker there. That's the all-weather blanket. And this here is a different brand, but like an all-weather blanket. This is something that I can reuse. Again, I, that got a little hole in it. Uh -huh. I put some tape on it. Oh, so that other thing you can't reuse? The space blanket generally are like a mylar. You might be able to use it on a trip, but no, I'm not making a tarp out of this, a cover, and then wrap it up in the next day using it on the ground. It's a very, very thin. It's really for emergencies. Okay. I'm saying because I had one, I never even used it, but yeah. it's it's super thin, like yeah. the package is like the this. The package is about this size. They're, uh, you know, they're going to be probably one time use almost, oh, okay. or they're good for in the cars. You know, good to wrap yourself up. Emergency units will have them. Uh, but that's a little bit heavier duty. So again, has some grommets on it so I can actually tie it to trees and really beat on it. Okay. So I have that thicker one for really beating on. In my first aid kit, I have a small, again. So my other question is like, yes, you put that down, 
on the ground first so that you're not putting your pack down on like the wet leaves or snow so that you right. can set everything up. So once you're all set up, what do you do with that? Like if it's really windy. No, like, well, what I'll do is I'll just like, pick it up, I'll roll it up and tuck it under my tent. Uh, again, I like say, I said, my, like my sons are covering. Print, like, under your tent. Yeah, my sons are covering. I'm, I mean, roll it up. I'm not using it as a ground cloth. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you do should have a ground cloth underneath your tents, the clear plastic, yeah. or what they do now is called footprints. Footprints are a little more expensive, but they're lighter and they attach to the tent. So for backpacking, footprints are very light and very small. Footprints and ground cloths do three things. They protect from rocks and sticks, okay? Um, they add some waterproofing, but they also keep that tent clean. So when you go to pack it away, moisture's not clinging to that mud and dirt. Um, this, what I'll do is I'll just roll it up like that and stick it inside the door, stick it underneath there. If it does get really cold, throw it on top of myself. You know, try to keep it loose so not so much <coughs> condensation um, mm -hmm. builds up underneath there. Again, my, uh, again if it's, uh, Super sunny or windy, you could put it tied to a tree as a wind block. You could do many things with it. Multiple use. Yeah. Uh, so you like to have stuff in your pack that you use for multiple mm -hmm. different things. Yeah. So again, I, again, in leaves, more of it so I don't have the wet stuff. And like I said, I like to pack outside my tent. Yeah. So I'm not yeah. missing a pair of socks or a glove and it's on there. You know, if it's just thrown on the ground. Okay. Um, but yeah. these talking the size of that? That's a five by seven, five by eight. And what's it called? A multi five by seven. Um, all weather blanket. All weather blanket, and SOL is one of the companies that have a similar all weather blanket. Um, you know, again, it's a five by seven. Has some grommets in the end there. And again, you know, um, I mean, there are some people that have it and never use it. I just personally, I make a habit out of it, and I use it a lot. Make sure my kids all have it. What's that one called? This is just another brand. This is SOL, and they're calling it Heavy Duty Emergency Blanket. Okay. Other questions? Another question? Approximate rating of the sleeping bags? Uh, well, the temperature ratings are always assuming you have a pad under them. There is no the 20 degree bag. Is for, yeah. for winter camping? Oh, for winter camping? Zero. Well, that really depends. Um, no. uh, you, if, if this, this sleeping bag here, this one here is a, a negative 20 degree bag. Okay. So again, that's all relative. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, this is a zero. Th they will make women's specific bags, and really the shape might be just a little bit different may have a little bit more um, insulation, say in the feet or something. Women tend to have a little bit uh, colder extremities. You know, and just, you know, sleeping pads are made a little bit different too. But again, for all practical purposes, they're similar. They do make some big guy sizes that may give you a little more stretch. Um, for temperature ratings uh, yeah, on sleeping bags, uh, you, the temperature, the question becomes, what's the coldest you're going to go out in? All right, and then you get a bag that's for that kind of weather. Um, I have two bags. I have a, a summer bag and I have a winter bag. All right, so my winter bag, I you don't see it all summer and fall and spring. I don't see it. And then my winter bag, which is this bag, I pull out in the winter. And uh, again, as Russell had talked previously, you want to store your bag outside of a stuff sack in a laundry bag or some kind of way to keep it from getting all compressed and everything because the maintenance of your gear is important so that it's going to be usable when you need to use it. Um, so if you want to go 20 below zero, then you should probably get a bag that's 20 below zero. But you know, now you're walking through a landscape where trees are going crack, pop, it's because they're, the sap is, 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 is breaking and then you have to answer yourself the question, is that what I want to do? If you gotta say 20 below, no way, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna to go to zero. Then you get yourself a zero bag, that's your winter bag. And, uh, and then, you know, you have two bags. You can use them for, you know, mostly you use your three season bag a lot more because you're gonna be doing that a lot more, but you have now the option of a winter pack. You know, so what we've been talking about here is building up your winter pack, which is an addition of some items. And then you just use them when you want to go and do that stuff. Yeah, Steve, some of the win I'm sorry, Steve, yeah. in the winter time, you're only using the down bag? I'm only using that down bag in the winter time. Okay. Absolutely. You're only going with a down bag, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, okay, yes and no. 
if if you're really good at keeping yourself dry and not making the mistake of getting your bag wet, yes, you can go it down. Because if you go it down and you get it wet, you then you're gonna lose 70% of the insulating qualities of your sleeping bag. Ouch, <laughs> it's a big ouch. And so you really need to, you know, if you can do that, then, then uh, you have the skills, anything that comes at you, you know you're gonna be able to contend with. Uh, then then yes, you can pay the extra money for a down bag and, and go that distance. Otherwise, synthetic bags give you, they only lose 30% of the insulating qualities if they get wet. So um, if, if, you know, learning is learning, we all make mistakes, something happens, you still got 70% of the insulating qualities to keep you warm. And then you, your bag can dry out. Um, so, you know, a lot of like Boy Scouts and stuff like that, I, I usually try to advise, you know, you want to go with something that has, gives you a, 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 a pretty good, uh, you know, error uh, space. Um, then as your skills get better and better and better and better, you can get a lot more, you know, you can uh, go a little more uh, with down and things like that so that you, uh, you can save the weight. The reason we mentioned Boy Scouts a couple times is they do camp once a month. Throughout, Sometimes it's yeah. in cabins, some guys do nothing but backpacking. But things you can do, again, to if your bag isn't, again, getting a uh, bag liner can ex take your three season bag and make it a little bit warmer, getting that bag liner. I was telling you earlier, I like using a rectangle bag as much as I can get away with, <laughs> and I know it's not as warm, so I'm actually bringing a thicker wool hat maybe a thicker pair of socks and wearing a pair of gloves so I can stretch a little bit more. But so I'm adding insulation, maybe not in a uh, extra thinner bag inside, but by putting the extra clothes on. Right. Forgetting yeah. stuff, you know, improvising. You know, I've gone times where I forgot a hat. I'll just put a t-shirt on like a do-rag here. That's adding some extra insulation. There's different things you can do. I told you earlier, I might take my backpack and lean that up against me. Mm -hmm. um, I could take that pad, like that um, blanket, space blanket, put that over me, raincoat over your feet, you know. So there's other stuff you can do to, to adapt. The more you do it, you'll find out what you're comfortable with, what, what degree bag, you know. So that's sort of a target range. Um, or again, wearing a thicker uh, wicking layer. But again, mostly what I found again too, don't get too hot too quick in your bag. No. Other questions at all? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm planning a trip, going with a bunch of people for New Year's. I don't think I would make winter backpacking like a regular thing for me, mm -hmm. but I want to at least do it once. Like how okay. it was them to spend New Year's in the backcountry. So that's why I'm here. And my friends are telling me, I have a three season tent, they're taking their three season tents, as long as it's not like crazy winds or anything. Mm -hmm. um, my sleeping bag is rated to 30 degrees, and I have the thermorest, like the liner inside. Okay, the 30 degree bag is basically, you can correct me, Mike, this is what it's saying, it is a summer bag. Okay, like <laughs> yeah, they're telling me that I'll be fine with like other layers, and I'm thinking, I wouldn't mind spending money on uh, Yeah, I, you, you a, need a to definitely, bag. I would definitely go for some warmer bags, depending on how far you're going, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about another Boy Scout troop that does, they make Quincy's, which are snow huts in the snow. Um, that's all Steve needs. Steve's mm -hmm. been doing this a while. They're being very protective to make sure everything's okay. They actually have the boys bring two sleeping bags. You know, when I was growing up too, sometimes I would have two sleeping bags to make sure you're warm, depending on how far you're going. Now, I wouldn't say this first trip, you know, is to go out there New Year's Eve and celebrating New Year's Eve, which, you know, and going out there camping. I would be going in the backyard even this time of year and seeing how well that works, you know. Yeah, I want to test and, it out and, before and I go test it out again. Out, Just out going to the backyard is yeah. a great way to. Yeah, tomorrow's a good day. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a concrete yeah. backyard, so that will not be fun. Yeah. Well, again, I'll have to go to someone good, else's good backyard. Sleeping pad, yeah. though, good sleeping pad, still, that, you know, although the ground is cold, it's, you know, yeah. Yeah, in fact, a con you bring up a good point. Concrete, you know, would be like, oh my God, that's you know, really number one hard. But at least it's flat. It doesn't have really knobby things to go around it. Um, but it's also kind of replicating what a really cold ground is like. 
All right, frozen ground, concrete, they got a lot in common. And so, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a bad idea either. Uh, so, uh, it might not be the ideal scenery, but. Yeah, again, well, whatever. Yeah. You're not really out there for the scenery, you're, you're looking at the islands. You're, you're t so, testing uh, it out hopefully. to see what you need to do. Right, and, and again, see how the, okay. your 30 degree yeah. bag does. If your 30 degree, you know, let's like, see, uh, if I understand, you, you're going to do some backpacking, right? Yeah. Right, so you know, yeah. taking double sleeping bags is going to be a little bit. Have better. you backpacked before? Oh yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so I just good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no. Three baby seasons. steps. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Right in here. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, that's where um, like a liner becomes a valuable mm -hmm. thing. All right, and also something that you can put over your bag. All right, so do you have an ins? What what what's your big insulated coat look like? The one that would be you would use camping. Like my puppy coat, okay, your puppy coat is um what is it like eight hundred? Okay, down. yeah. How big? It's, it goes down to your waist, right? Somewhere down to here. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, you could experiment with um, you know wrapping that around your sleeping bag and okay. zipping it up. You know things like that. You know. Um, so uh, if you don't want to get a sleeping bag, but you know you, you definitely you get need yourself a, a thirty. Bag. You might not have to yeah. get a twenty. Thirty degrees is really okay. pushing the envelope. Yeah. I mean, especially if you get down to like twenty or something. Well, I love the bed that I have, so I would just get the same bag in like the next cold. Oh, there you go. There you the go. The lower thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's 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 tailored the same way. I did something really just like that. I had a light down jacket that I never tried. I had always thought when growing up the down jackets had to be just puffy. So I got this thing from uh, another place, and I I never wore it. And I said, you know what? I'm going to crack the window open. I did this yesterday. I put it on, and I laid in bed. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was comfortable. I said, okay, I could use this for backpacking. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it was very small and packable, sure. but my eyes doesn't convince me that because it's that thin that it's going to keep me warm. Right. Like getting on the concrete, I just like will crack the window open, put it on, and then see what happens to my body. Mm -hmm. As so far as puffiness and that goes, generally the puffier stuff is, the warmer it is. Now if you're just standing there, so if you're in camp and you're just standing there, something really, really puffy, is going to keep you warm. However, really a lot also has to do with the wind protection. So if you had a thinner jacket that actually had wind protection in layers, when you're actually moving and your arms are swishing around and you're hiking, a wind protector might hold in more warmth than something that's just puffy. So wind protection also has a lot to, to, to do with that. So having that thin layer with a, again, that yeah. protective layer over top, that could be enough for so this is a, a type of jacket, it's a, called a hunker down, and uh, it really lives up to its name. I use it as my, like, puffy down jacket, you know, and uh, this I would wear around camp. This is part of my camp clothes. I pack this away, I don't use this when I'm hiking. Um, and then I also use it as my pillow, and uh, in a, in a uh, pillow case that I carry. And um, so it, it has double duty. It is something that, you know, like Russ said, when you get to camp and you're making food and stuff like that, or when you're first getting up in the morning, you want to get all bundled up because, you know, you're not doing anything. You're not doing any work. And, um, and so a jacket, a bigger jacket like that, but you want to make sure that it's compressible enough. Now, you can do a similar thing using an idea Russ just brought up, and that is you can have a lighter type of down vest or jacket and then put a shell over the top of it. So now what you've done is you have a, like an a, a air barrier like this that's really thin. Like a quarter inch. Like hardly anything, right? And then you got another air barrier right on the other side of it, which is your shell. And so the two actually reinforce each other and you have a, symbi a symbiosis, uh, increases the heat. So, you know, that, that, you know as, you, as you play around with all this stuff, like Russ said early on when we first started, uh, you know, you, you get an idea of how this all works, and then you start to build your knowledge, and then you can, you got, I always say, you have a lot of things in your quiver. You can pull them out whenever you need them, put them back when you don't. And again, just practice, have fun, mm -hmm. use everyday situations, like again, talking about the snow again, when you're out there shoveling, mm -hmm. or just, you know, feel how quickly things warm up, and try to adjust, and try to stay uh, ah, that brings up moist stuff. free. Um, you can actually, you can actually have your body acclimatized to winter. You can. That, that's something you can actually do. It's 
uh, takes a conscious effort. <laughs> but literally, you go outside with, uh, and it's just like at home, and you just do the thing, like you have to go outside and do something outside, whatever. I, for me, I have to go fetch wood, because I have a wood stove. So I go out and I fetch wood, and maybe I split some wood to, to um, you know, start the fire in the stove, because it's kind of dwindled down. And so I'll go out just like this, you know, and it's be like 20 degrees out. And I'll just walk around, and I, what I do is I just, you know, you just start ignoring the cold. Yes, I'm cold, but it's just cold. It's just no big deal. Big deal. And you start to build up your resistance to cold. All right, and uh, that's actually pretty helpful over time. Um, uh, another thing is you could a good way is you get in your car and you don't turn the heat on and drive to work. You know, I had an old Volkswagen that had no heat in it at all, and, and, and so I learned about that by just driving around this old beat-up Volkswagen for a long time during the winter time. And look, hey, you know, you, you, your your blood and your body adjust to the conditions that you find yourself in. It's really amazing our body. So, you know, you can you can do that. And now I'm not saying that it's a fun thing to do, uh, but it is like exercise, something you can do to build up your resistance to cold. So. His new car now has heated seats. I heated seats, <laughs> yeah. 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 Power windows even. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. But it's, it's like training at the gym. I mean, it is, uh, it's totally like that. When you're training and you're, you're hurting and aching, but you know there's a, there's a payoff at the end. And the same thing with you acclimating to that cold. Yeah, totally. the payoff mm -hmm. of your tolerance and you're able to keep on functioning. It is, that's very true. That's exactly the similarities are 100%. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Well, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thanks and, for coming. Yeah, yeah. I had a good time. I'm getting psyched to go winter camping now. <laughs> <laughs> First, I think, yeah. <laughs> all right. And again, look forward to our other courses that we're going to be doing in the. You know, and if you have any suggestions nice. about courses you'd like us to, to, to do, email us. Yeah. We want to know. Like I say, we are yeah, going to do one on definitely. primitive fire starting, bow and drill and stuff. Yeah. He does some on orienteering. Is there anything you guys think you might want to do or be interested in? Um, well, I uh, yes. And yeah. even if you, yeah, even if you do list. just come <laughs> in and, uh, again, had just questions on sleeping bags, again, our, all our employees are knowledgeable in their areas and even just help fitting in the packs help the pack fitting. If you have a pack that you have already, you can bring it in and we'll fit it for you. Make sure it fits you properly. You know, go over the sleeping bags, go over the tents, you know, whatever you need. Okay, again, thank you. <laughs>